Welcome to Wine Soundtrack USA. Listen to the passion with which producers narrate their winery and their world. In 30 Answers, discover their stories, personalities, and passions. Hello, friends and listeners of Wine Soundtrack. This is Allison Levine, and today I am sitting in the beautiful Dry Creek Valley in Healdsburg in northern Sonoma with Mick Unti of Unti Vineyards. Mick, welcome to Wine Soundtrack, and tell us about Unti Vineyards. Thanks, Allison. I really appreciate you coming up today. Well, this is a classic model of a European sort of state or small California family-owned winery. My, we have 60 acres of land, um, and we farm all of our own grapes, and uh, initiated by my dad and his wife buying property up here in 1990. And then um, we he planted some grapes that people haven't planted up here, Syrah, Sangiovese, and there was Zinfandel. We started home winemaking from those three. And then in 1997, we made the delusional decision to have our grapes custom crushed. And we uh, started the winery at that time as a commercial venture. Um, prior to that, I have only worked in the wine business since uh, I squandered my college education <laughs> on some subjects that didn't really pan out financially. And uh, so I've, I've only, I started working in the wine business while I was in college and I'm, I kept working until somebody was not gonna pay me anymore and here I sit. Wow. So I was familiar with that. And at the time before we, when we wa uh, started the business, I was working for a small winery in Sonoma County called Kendall Jackson and, um, and doing national sales. So I kind of wanted to get out of that pace mm -hmm. and uh so we started the business in 97 and uh, we're still co-owners and uh now we just kind of kept getting more delusional as our uh, as the process keeps going i love it a father-son team so you said you have 60 acres are you doing exclusively estate fruit oh yeah and my dad actually sells some grapes to some other wineries so um yeah it, it's it it's you know there are advantages to having your own grapes and part of that is that we decide when we decide to plant a grape like Fiano or Multipulciano or Grenache Blanc or Vermentino or Alianico, um, very difficult to convince growers to do that. Um, so it's enabled us to kind of follow our passion, follow our interest, follow our intuition about what wines might be interesting here and it's kind of served us well. Those all. All of those wines have uh, been successful for us. And what? how many different grapes are you growing here? I think, I can't remember, it's like 15 or 16. Um, so, and, and part of that is we have experimental things, like we have a half acre that's, or a quarter of an acre that's split between Bianca Lella and Falangina. So I think it's something like 16. Wow, very cool. And what's your total case production? We're generally between eight and 9,000 cases, depending on the vintage and, uh, uh, that's about all our facility can process. Uh, mm -hmm. Jason Valenti, our winemaker, get, you know, when we start to push over 120 tons, it's really difficult for him to squeeze it all in. So mm -hmm. we try to stay in that range. And where are your wines available? In the tasting room or what markets? We're up now, thanks to the pandemic, we're 90% direct to consumer. Uh, but we uh, also wholesale our wine direct in California by ourselves. and. Uh, so that means we're, our wines are sort of available in Southern California, really available. Well, used to, all these things are prior to sure. 18 months ago, but uh, pretty big distribution in the Bay Area. Uh, prior to the pandemic, we had about 240 accounts in California, most of those restaurants. So they're available here. And then we have a smattering of tiny distributors in places like uh, Texas and Arizona and Oregon, but it's completely haphazard because I, I don't pay that much attention to it anymore. <laughs> Someone else's job. <laughs> it's nobody's job, nobody does it. <laughs> um, so when you think back, you said you've been in the wine industry your entire life, but what's your first memory relevant to wine? Uh, you know, it's kind of interesting. I think when I f was 20, and I'm from San Jose originally, but was going to University of Washington in Seattle. Worked a summer in San Jose because my mom lived down there. And uh, three friends of mine from high school, we couldn't go to the beach in Santa Cruz. So we went wine tasting in the Hecker Pass region. And we visited this kind of goofy winemaker named Thomas Cruz. And he got off his tractor, walks into this shed, starts pouring three glasses of wine on a wood stump 
And even at age 20, I said, oh, so that guy does that, this, and that, and it results in that. This is an interesting thing. <laughs> even at my, you know, not so great mental state of age 20, I even, I, there was just something very attractive to that. So then I started to just become obsessed with small family wineries. They all have stories. The common thread, I think, almost always is there's, you know, not all, there's some screws loose in every single brain behind any of those. And I was attracted to that. And uh, so I just, it became my obsession. I was reading about wine and tasting wine, and then I was able to work wine in retail. And then that, all that did was throw more gas on the fire. So <laughs> it just became sort of my obsession. Well, so as a child, being from an Italian family, was wine on the table? Were you drinking it as a kid? Yeah, it was not. I mean, not as a, you know, I mean, in, in high school, my dad, my dad was really into wine. Uh, he was into wine in the late 60s. So he was into the you know, sort of the creative experimental guys of the time, you know, guys like Robert Mondavi, who, you know, some guy who started the winery and, <laughs> you know, Louis Martini, uh, he worked as a Safeway store manager in the town of Saratoga. So one of his customers was Martin Ray. Um, so my dad was interested in wine. So we, we, he would expose us to, he always asked us if we wanted wine. And I never really, you know, it was kind of too dry for me. Uh, but I remember liking Robert Mondavi Gamay. Ah. And I thought, you know, it was a softer, fruity. Yeah. And, but it wasn't, but it was enough to, for me to know that when I was in college and, you know, all of my friends are drinking cleaning products and, uh, you know, everything under the sun, I always reserved wine for, I knew it was something that was interesting and special and I wouldn't, you know, I would drink everything else except for that if we were not right. having dinner. And so, um, is there one particular wine that stands out as an aha moment somewhere along the path? It could have been earlier or later know. in your career. I, I really don't know. I think it's more of a an amalgam or a, a, or a cul culmination of things. Uh, I have several moments. I don't uh -huh. think there's, you know, when I was first in the wine business up in Washington State, and there was this tiny importer, Zephyr Imports, who brought in all these great Rieslings. And this is like, you know, I'm now I'm 22. And we're tasting 71, 75, 76, uh, you know, uh, Longbert, Langbert von Simmeren, Rheingau, and Schloss Reinhardshausen, Rheingau, and Fritz Hogg, and, <laughs> you know, all these great producers in the Mosel and the Rheingau. And I just remember being completely fascinated by that. Or trying, the first time I tried Shah Vermitage. I was out of my mind, or you know, you know, even remembering uh, tasting uh, Gunlock Bunchu's Bateau Ranch Cabernet that was aged in American oak, and connecting that to BV, which is aged in American oak, and connecting that to Silver Oak, and these are things that you remember when you're just uh, honing your sensory evaluation skill to identify winemaking techniques, or in the case of Germany sites that stick out and you know uh, then it just kept kept going to where you know Didier Dagano or it's um, a long long list yeah, no, so I mean it, there's so many or the first time I had great Bur Burgundy it was Comte de Vogue I mean and so you you these things stick in your mind because they are such compelling experiences and they're steps along the way so if we were to come into your home and go into your cellar, are all those the kind of wines that we'd find in there? Or yeah. what do you tend to have? The ones at home would be probably more dominated by Italy and France. I mean, and Italy has become more of a recent fascination, not recent, but has steadily taken more of my wine goof time because uh, of many reasons, uh, traveling there and also just during the time frame that I've been in the wine business, Italy as a country, has almost completely flipped in terms of uh, becoming more sophisticated, specialized, and serious about winemaking and grape growing. And then when you realize that there are 465 indigenous varieties that they agree on, I mean, that's that not even- they classify. Yeah, I was just gonna say that they classify. <laughs> and who knows how many that might not include. Um, you know, so it's my, uh, you know, I'm totally, you know, enthralled when 
like try at Neroso, and it's Norella Mascalese, and I don't know that much about it, or Ketacante from Sicily, or uh, Alianico from Campania, or Fiano, or Greco, or Falangina from Campania, and uh, understand, or Verdicchio and Montepulciano from <laughs> the Marche. I mean, so all these places, you've just seen this absolute uh, metamorphosis in the sophisticated of, uh, sophistication of Italian wine. And it's such a manifestation of their culture uh, that it is intriguing to me. Um, is there any particular wine you opened in the last few nights or weeks that drank really well? Oh yeah. <laughs> Definitely, and it's a wine that, um, it's called La Pergola Torta uh, by Montevertini. Montevertini is a Chianti, a producer in the Chianti zone near the town of Rada, and their 100% Sangiovese is called La Pergola Torta. And he named it that when the Chianti Consortium did not allow winemakers in Chianti to make 100% Sangiovese and call it Chianti, they had that old law from Ricosoli that said they had to blend whites. Right. And he didn't want to do that. And he said, screw you guys. I'm going to make this wine and watch me sell it for a lot more money than you <laughs> bozos sell Chianti Classico for. So, and it's just a beautiful expression of Sangiovese. They almost, you could, it's, a, it's perfection in terms of Sangiovese. Mm. Yeah. So do you think there's a such thing as a perfect variety? No. Uh, you know, Riesling. How about that? Oh. Um, <laughs> uh, no, I don't know. I, I do not think there's a such thing as a perfect variety. I think there is a perfect, there's perfection when uh, it's a combination of folks who really love their region and are willing to push the envelope every single vintage to get better. And, uh, and then I think there's a, then that achieves perfection to me. And that can be, in a number of places. And that's why even if I don't ever make Riesling and I never would off this property or Pinot Noir off this property, it doesn't mean I don't want to drink them and you know really appreciate how that winemaker or producer has what they've learned over time and how I can rely on you know Graffier Burgundy regardless of the vintage or I can I can rely on Donoff Riesling in the Naha because He's, he, he's constantly pushing to get better. The, the reach for perfection. Yeah. So yeah. on, that, on yeah. that reach, what's your opinion on wine critics and scores? Um, I, don't have, I don't have much of a feeling about it. It's, you know, it's uh, people, I think it's a good thing for consumers to have some kind of roadmap in the world of wine. Um, I think it's good for winemakers to kind of get some uh, verification or confirmation that maybe other people like your wine. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have, I, don't, I mean, uh, you know, if you're getting, if you're trying to get me to say something dumb, like in Mondovino, um, <laughs> no. the, I don't have an opinion about uh, no. Parker or I don't have an opinion about, uh, you know, various no, I think you people. said it. I think you said it perfectly in the sense that it provides a roadmap, maybe yeah. for people who don't. Yeah, know. for sure. I mean, for someone who likes the wines that uh, used to be sort of stereotypical Robert Parker wines, why not? Right. I mean, they, at least they know what they like. Right. Um, so I don't. I, I really. I, I. I don't. I. I. I obviously consult them, and and you know, if I'm trying to buy a seventy dollar or eighty dollar Burgundy, you know, it helps that Stephen Tanzer or. You know, someone I or you know, someone I uh, trust has uh, has Tasted. had has had a good experience with yeah. that. So, simple answer: red, white, or rosé. Jeez, <laughs> that's another one I can't possibly answer. Yeah. Still, or still, uh, what, what, what is it? Uh, I'm like uh, I'm like Daniel in uh, in Schitt's Creek. I like them all. <laughs> still or sparkling. Jeez, I drink. I would drink champagne every day if given the chance. We have a, <laughs> my wife. My wife named a goat after Pierre Gimonet. So we have we have a goat named Gimonet. So what does that tell you? <laughs> so maybe maybe it would just be spark. At least my reputation among our friends or people who know me is that yeah, every time I show up, it's with a uh -oh. grower producer champagne. <laughs> and how do you approach food and wine pairing? Um, Obviously you come from an Italian family and as we spoke at the beginning, wine is always on the table. So 
What are you looking for? Do you follow rules? Do you think rules are important? Are there certain tips you use that you could share? Uh, yeah, that's a good question because I think almost everyone expects winemakers to have the answer or have some kind of an answer. No, I don't. <laughs> for, for anything, by the way. <laughs> that's my kids. Um, <laughs> You know, I try to find wines that are going to be balanced enough and interesting enough to go with a pretty big range of things because I don't, you know, I I still like to have a wine that I want to have. And then if it's as long as it's not annihilating the the food that we're having with it, then I'm kind of okay with that. Uh, But I I would follow big, you know, I'm not going to have Alianico with uh, with shrimp. Yeah, I mean, (laughs) but... But I'm, I'm not that, you know, you know, I'll have a Barbera with sushi or I'll, I would have a Pinot Noir with sushi or I would have a Fiano with something more savory like a mushroom uh, dish. So, I, I mean, as long as the wine's got enough personality and good structure, I, I have to say, you know, that's been my whole mantra in the wines we make and the wines that I enjoy, and it's a function of enjoying wines, that I want to always make sure that Acidity and tannin are part of the program here because all the wines I enjoy from around the world uh, have a priority of that along with the other things. Hmm. So for somebody who hasn't had the pleasure to taste the Unti wines yet, what do you think they're missing out on? Uh, I think I think it's, uh, you know, they're missing out on a producer that's not afraid to take chances and see where that path goes. I think we, uh, there was a master sommelier who kind of summarized our wine really quickly. She said, um, your, your wines have the fruitiness and the expression I expect Dry Creek to have with tannin and acidity, which is kind of European. And I think that's exactly what they're missing out. If they want to try to find a producer that's straddling the, the gap or the chasm between Europe and in California, I think we would be that answer. Hmm. And if space aliens were to come land on your beautiful property right now, which of your wines would you want to welcome them with? Um, God, <laughs> That's, is that like the, the answering about who are your favorite kids? No, um, no, 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 not at all. Because, you know, you're welcoming them. So is it your freshest white that you're going to welcome with? Is it your flagship red? I don't know. What do you welcome? What would you want to showcase someone, impress them with your first wine? I I would say our Cuvée Foudre, which is a blend of Grenache, Mauved, and Syrah, almost evenly split between the three. Uh, Because I do think that really symbolizes what uh, I said earlier about what our wines can be. And I think it's also a really compelling wine. So, I mean, somebody would go, wow, I don't, I don't know where this is from exactly, but this wine checks all the boxes and it would be a statement about sort of our quest of how we've evolved and, and tried really hard to make that kind of wine and what it, what it takes in the vineyard and, and in the winery to do that. So I think that's probably what I do. Well, speaking of your vineyards, um, as we're sitting among them, surrounded all the windows, so beautiful. Um, But I'm wondering, how much variation do you see from vintage to vintage? You've been here a while now, and um, do you see more nuanced? Do you see big differences? Um, And, yeah. I think they're more nuanced. And I I think early on when we weren't as... uh, experienced with how to uh, farm for quality, then I think that's when we were more subject to vintage variation because you have higher crop levels or you might be watering your vines too much or you're not pruning a certain way or most importantly, you're not crop thinning enough. And now over time, we've learned how to do that, how to manage that with our seven person crew in the vineyard and how they know how to do things like crop thinning faster than they've ever done. And that, once you establish sort of good levels of crop and good ways of farming, and we've been farming organically since 2003, and your vines get older, they tend to compensate more for big vintage variation. We're still gonna have nuances, so I Mm -hmm. absolutely appreciate those as part of the gig. But I think our level of consistency evens out some of that vintage variation. Are there any sort of predictors that you look for that are going to tell you what a vintage is going to give you? 
Uh, I'm speaking to someone in Northern California that's seen a fire almost every year, so. You know, I used to, I think probably, it's not, not not early indicators. I'd say, you know, if we go through a summertime where uh, we don't have these massive swings in heat spells and it's nice and even and then we get into fall and uh, you have similar weather only and, and it stretches out the growing season, then I would say that's absolutely going to be a knockout growing season. So a, a season like 2018, possibly 2016, 2012, those were just like that. Mm-hmm. You know, the seasons that are more challenging are 2017 where we had some heat spells, 2020 where we had some serious heat spells and then we had some fires and then we had a layer of smoke over the vineyards (laughs) while it was 112 and we're trying to harvest Ferentino and Grenache Blanc at fresh fruity stages. I mean, so yeah, you know, we, when we look back at a vintage like 2020 and we say, wow, I don't know how we made, just as what Jason has said, I don't know how we made wine from there. And I'm telling you, these 2020s are beautiful and they're fine. We're drinking one right now. And so I think that uh, the combination of planting Mediterranean varieties that can handle this heat and also getting better at farming allows us to handle adversarial uh, climate conditions. Um, As you wander through your vineyard and talk you know, see your vines, do you ever talk to them? Kind of encourage, it sounds like after last year, they need a lot of encouragement. <laughs> no, I just play, you know, play a lot of Bill Evans. I play Bill Evans uh, piano, so they, they seem to like settle down. It keeps them from getting too wacky. That's the vines or that's when the wine's in the barrel? Both. Oh. <laughs> no, I, I, no, I don't really say anything to the vines, you know. It's, yeah, and have you and your dad established any traditions that you guys do at the start of harvest? Yes, we drink, guess what we drink? Um, we champagne? Drink champagne, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So, was there anything else you wanted to be when you were a little boy? Before oh, you sure. fell into wine, what was Absolutely, it? Positively, I told people this until I was probably a freshman in college. Um, I was going to play baseball. Ooh. So, I, oh, that was what I was going to do, and I didn't even think about anything else. In fact, when I went to junior college, to my first year of junior college was just so I could keep playing. And... Um, so yeah, no, that was, it was really easy. I mean, over time, I think there are other things that I wanted to do and I still would want to do. Uh, like I love, I love public radio. I love community-based radio. That was what I got my degree in. And guess how, <laughs> guess how uh, successful that <laughs> was. <laughs> beneficial that's been for me in my life. Um, but I would do it now. I mean, it would be something that I would want to do mm-hmm. if I were retired. I love the idea of communicating on a level that, um, is not pretentious, but still connected to what you what you like and seeing if other people uh, have any, if it resonates with anybody else. And when you're not um, working in the vineyard or working in the winery, what do you do in your free time? Uh, you know, we eat a lot. <laughs> we go to restaurants, we eat oysters all the time. <laughs> and drink uh, champagne. And drink champagne, <laughs> go figure. Um, love reading, I mean, I love riding my bike. Uh, uh, I love spending time with my wife. She's a big animal advocate, so we, you know, that takes up a lot of our our time. Um, listen to music all the time. Listen to all kinds of music all the time. Oh, have good. A stupid, that'll come in, that'll come in handy later. Collection that is not, you know, also not a very practical thing to have. But um, yeah, I mean, I don't do as much. You know, I, we try to go to the coast as much as we can. You know, I'd like yeah. to do more. Um, so. I know that you were a baseball player, and who is your team? The Oakland A's. Uh huh. And sadly for me. Yeah. So, if the Oakland A's were to win a championship, which of your wines would you want to present them with? Uh, let's see. Our Sangiovese Reserva. How about that? Because ah, uh, it's right. it's a really that is the wine that is. Uh, dearest to both my dad and myself probably some sort of form of genetic uh, bias <laughs> and jed lowry who plays for the a's liked that wine when chili davis was the hitting coach for the a's because chili is a customer of ours well and that's his favorite wine so oh so things. see we don't even have to push it they already yeah, know, they know. <laughs> when you're planning a romantic evening for you and your wife I mean, I guess I know the answer to this. I was like, what wines would make for a romantic evening? Champagne, champagne, champagne. Uh, no, not necessarily. No, no, no. no. If I want to oh. get, if I want to have a successful, 
uh, date night, it's going to be with Didier Dagano. No question. That's it. We have a dog named Dagano. So that's what my... That's what you have my, set the bar so high naming your animals after champagne. I, and, and it's road my wife is doing this, so... How many animals do you have named after a famous producer? Uh, I guess those are the two. Do we have one? Oh, shoot, I'm sure, we, there's, I'm sure there's one other one. Uh, uh, I don't know. I, th I think that's it. Okay. But she's going to kill me. <laughs> she's third one. Um, when you look back at your career, um, you know, we all kind of carry information with us, things, advice mm -hmm. that people has given, have given us over the years. I'm wondering, is there a piece of advice that career-wise or personal, professional, or just general life yeah. that you carry? Yeah, I, I think, and this is what, you know, being a parent helps you with this because you're forced to sort of subconsciously do this with your kids, and that's how they learn. They don't learn from anything I say, um, certainly, thank goodness. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I think it's to try to live your life, whether it's your career or your life, to where you have a shred of something that's on your terms. Because there's so many pressures externally mm -hmm. in your business career and in your life that you have to compromise. And in, in wine, for me, you know, it was I could have when I left Kendall Jackson, I could have gone to work for some other big winery and made a lot more money than making it here. But it was a shot. It was I was at an age where if I didn't do it, then I was never going to do it. And um, it's, you know, it's a neat thing to say I my dad and I created this business that is a function of wines that we love or is, is, is a product of wines we love. And um, and at the same time, um, you know, still it's still it's a business. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, you know, try to find something that is going to motivate you when you're almost assuredly going to have those days where you don't want to be motivated. <laughs> so when you look back at your career, what would you say is one of your proudest achievements to date? Uh, I don't know. Um, <laughs> you know, probably here, it's probably just sort of, um, this is a, you know, trying to get, you know, get a business to where, <clears throat> have a brand that people really love. We have a really loyal clientele that, that really uh, expressed itself in 2020 when you were really tested for things like that. And to be able to kind of be myself in a, in a business and that, you know, the good, bad and the ugly and it still is enough to be successful. Um, and also be in certain situations, like when I was working for Kendall Jackson, when clearly my personality type and my character is very different from all the other executives there. And I was doing national sales for their smaller wineries, and I was clearly a wine guy, and the rest of the guys who were there were more sales guys, kind of, you know, gallo business guys. And, and to still be able to <clears throat> function as a business person who is really you know, marked as a as a wine person at the time that I was working there, most of the you either had two kinds of people: really good business people or wine people. The good wine people were horrible at business, and the business people were good enough at wine that they usually, you know, outperformed the the wine people. But I think it was you know it's good to I, I was proud that I could still perform in that arena, being a clearly a wine guy, and um, you know. It's, I like not being able to be stereotyped. Fair enough. Finish this sentence for me. A table without wine is like? A quiet table. <laughs> and now I want you to imagine a situation that we're sitting at a dinner table. Um, your wine is on the table. The paparazzi are pretty excited. They're outside taking shots. Because really someone, because <laughs> someone is sitting at that table, someone very special. Who from this, from any walk of life, living or deceased, do you wish you could share a bottle of Unti wine with? Oh man, um, Rachel Maddow. So if Rachel Maddow is listening, she should come to Unti Vineyards. She absolutely <laughs> should. She absolutely should. I mean, it's a recent uh, thing where she's been buying our wine and we've... Oh, she I'm, does buy your wine. She's my pen pal. So, That's um, right. So, um, I'm, jo I'm totally joking. No. So if she ever hears this, she'll, she'll, never, she'll never come She'll never come here. But I mean, it's, I mean she's such a brilliant journalist. She's mm -hmm. such a thoughtful, highly intelligent person who happens to be a fantastic journalist. And... Uh, 
I'm sure it would be an interesting interview. I like that. So if you were allowed to take three wines with you to a deserted island. <laughs> okay, I already, already answered most of them. So, I know, uh, champagne, champagne, no, and, no, no, no. and Dagenau. <laughs> no, um, no, I would say Comte de Vogue Mussigny. Okay. Um, probably Pergola Torta, uh, Sangiovese from Montevertini, and a Donoff uh, Niederhauser Hermann's Hola Spätnese. Oh, very specific, very I specific. like that. Yeah. Okay, let's see how specific you can get. This is this is a little game we play at the end where we pair wine and music since music plays yeah. such a part in our life and, and conjures up emotions like wine does. So I want you to take your three deserted island wines and pair them with music. Okay, let's see here. Um, the Chambeau the, uh, the, uh, the Burgundy would be with um, Brad Meldow. He's a jazz pianist. Okay. Um, um, and the uh, Sangiovese? Sangiovese would have to be with somebody, uh, let's see. I think the Sangiovese would have to be with um, Big Audio Dynamite. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> and the... the... horses are on the track, yeah. <laughs> and your Riesling? Uh, you know, I think Riesling because it's such an individual wine. My wife doesn't like Riesling that much and she certainly doesn't like sweet Riesling. So I would say... Um, the, the Riesling would have to go with Keith Jarrett. Okay. And what about, I've got a glass of your 2020 Cuvée Blanc here. Yeah, I love this wine. Uh, this is my favorite of the white wines that we... I love it. Grenache. We, it's Grenache, it's, Vermentino, and Pico. It's Grenache. I know we didn't put Blanc on there, so that's the fun of being a small winery where I make mistakes and we're behind the deadline <laughs> and we need to put these labels on anyway. So it's 42% Grenache Blanc, 42% uh, Vermentino, and 16%, I think, uh, Pic Pool. And when we planted these whites, it was strictly an experimental vineyard planted in roughly those proportions so that we could make this blend. And even though I love Vermentino, I love our Vermentino, I love our Grenache Blanc, I love Fiano, uh, the three of these grapes really are complementary to each other. Grenache Blanc's got more texture and more body. Vermentino is fruity and floral. And Pic Pool is like adding citric, something citric to the wine. <laughs> And uh, all three of these have really low pHs, even in a vintage like 2020, which was miserably hot. So they yeah. have high natural acidity. And um, so I, I just love this one. So I need, I need a song. For this? Uh, hmm. Gosh, you know, I'm just, I'm not, I wasn't ready for this. Uh, <laughs> uh, gosh. A song, song, song. Or artist. Or genre. Uh, let's see, so it would be, I'm trying to think of all these people I listen to. Ugh. Um, it would be something off of uh, Fiona Apple's new record. How about Ooh. that? Okay. And one more. You talked about um, the red wine, your Sangiovese, mm -hmm. uh, that you would give to your Oaklanese if they won. Yeah, this is a vineyard that my dad planted in 1992. And it's a, it's a clone of Sangiovese Grosso clone. So it's the one that's grown in Montalcino for Brunello. Um, and it's the west hillside of this really extreme, uh, steep, extremely steep terraced vineyard. And the west hillside only gets eastern, is an eastern facing, so it gets morning sunlight. Mm -hmm. And over the years, just this is a perfect example of what you learn when you pay attention to your vineyards. Um, this little vineyard block, which is probably only 10 rows out of the whole vineyard, always outperforms everything else. And it's a wine that when we line up the six different Sangioveses that we make, because we have seven acres of Sangiovese, it's very easy to tell even just by looking which one is the West Hillside. And uh, so what would you play with it? What would I play? Music-wise. What did I say? Did I say? No. Uh, I said Big Audio Dynamite, I think. Um, no, that was for the Italian Sangiovese. Okay. Same thing for yours? Oh, no. Uh, for ours, it would be something more... Uh, I'm trying to think of something more recent. Um, well, everything I have is old, so that's okay. Have to be old. Um, old is good. Yeah. How about um, it would be um, it would be Fleetwood Mac from a record called Bear Trees. 
I love it. Good job. I won't make, I won't put any more pressure on you. Those are pressure. I can answer everything else, man. No, it's like, I'm going to go back and say, I cannot believe I didn't say this. How did I forget that? Well, Mick, we're almost finished. I have one more question for you. It's sort of a two-part question. The first is, what wine region in the world is at the very top of your bucket list to hit next? Uh, I know you had spoken how Italy is. No, probably Sicily. Sicily? Yeah, because I haven't been there. Okay. And I haven't been to Germany, so I would go. I would like to go to Germany. Um, I've been to Burgundy, but not really wine tasting in Burgundy. So all, those are the three that I would for sure want to go to. I would agree with you. It'd be hard to pick which one first. Yeah, I mean, and I really, you know, the thing is, is that's the, you know, one of the many depressing things about the last 18 months is that, you know, you start to get to a point where you think your business is okay, where you can leave and you can start doing more of this stuff. And then that happens. Um, I would almost always opt to go to Italy for the fun part of Italy. I just love going there and there's a whole, a, a true vacation for me takes place in Italy. But I, those would be the reasons I would go. Well, you need to start planning your trip to Italy, but for other people, a fun trip is a trip to Sonoma. I agree. And if they were going to come to Sonoma, they should come to Dry Creek. And how can they find you? Where can they find you? And when are you open? What do you offer here? We are open every day, or no, we're open for by appointment Thursday through Sunday. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're on our mailing list or if you want to come during the week, you just contact us. But we take appointments on the hour uh, and we're trying to limit our groups here because of social distancing. And actually, that's been a blessing because it's, it's better for us. So we're open those days and you can schedule appointments through our website or by calling us at the winery. And um, and then what else did you ask me? Uh, how do they? How do they guess? find you? Really, I don't know. I mean, you know, <laughs> through our website, I guess, uh, otvineyards.com. Um, so we're not really that. <laughs> we're not really that aggressive about social media or or putting our names out there, our name out there that much. Well, so if you come up to Sonoma, drive up Dry Creek, past Healdsburg, come to Unti Vineyards. It's a special treat, even if. Mick doesn't really know how to find you. (laughs) So anyway, Mick, thank you for joining us today on Wine Soundtrack. (laughs) Thank you very much, Allison. I really appreciate it. Thanks for listening to a new episode of Wine Soundtrack USA. For details and updates, visit our website, winesoundtrack.com.